was at a road race in the 70s with some of my friends. On Saturdays, after qualifying, we had a beer party. I noticed this red Ferrari driving around the infield and it drove up to me. Two guys got out. One was Italian and very good looking. The other fellow was also good looking, but very American. Please understand that in the 70s, I was in my late teens and I was quite attractive. Now, if the Italian guy had asked me out, I would have gone, but he didn't. The American introduced himself and said, hi, I'm Ted, and I introduced myself. Ted eventually asked me if I'd like to take a spin in the Ferrari. I responded, um, I'm sorry, I'm with someone right now. What I wanted to say was that I hated my date and I'd like to get lost, but something made me feel weird about doing that. Ted said that he would see me tomorrow at the race and also asked where I was staying. By that time, my date had walked up and I had left with him. To those of you wanting to know, nope, his eyes didn't look funny. I'm a very perceptive person, normally, but perhaps that the truly scary thing about Ted was that he was so effing normal. I didn't know who Ted Bundy was at the time, but I began to hear about a serial killer doing his thing in Washington, Colorado, and finally in Florida. I soon found out that it was the Ted that I met at the race day, Ted Bundy, and surprisingly, I'm still alive. Sometime after I got home, I read a book called The Deliberate Stranger. That was Ted. When they executed Ted, I read about the headlines in the tabloids at the grocery store I was at. There was a picture of Ted after he had been executed. No kidding, it was horrid. I thought Ted was such a waste. Ted was so good looking, he had the world by the towel, he was in law school and active in the Republican Party. I felt sorry for Ted and I still feel sorry for him till this day. I guess that you can say I had the honour of working with two serial killers in my career in the forensic field. Years ago, before I got 100% into psychology, I worked in the forensic field and I had dreams of working in the legal system. So, when I had the chance to work for a maximum security prison in my state for juveniles, I decided to jump at the chance. After applying and getting picked, I went to training and they assigned me to my unit. When I got there, they started assigning me all of these inmates to work with for mental health. That's when I got told about the first one they gave me. No one wanted to work with him. The guards wanted to kill him and inmates tried several times to do so. And even my boss at the time told me that every time the guy's around, he wants to throw up. I took a look at the youngster's chart and then I saw why. He was a serial killer. He had been killing his schoolmates slowly and methodically, but he got careless on his last one and that's what led to his capture. What he did was the stuff of legend and nightmares. He had a desire for a 10 year old girl who he went after at a birthday party of another family member of his. When no one was looking, he abducted her, did things to her that would make Bundy shudder and then dumped her into a garbage dumpster. But there was only one problem, she was still alive. As a citizen came to her aid, she later told police who did it. He was not what I expected. A chubby, white kid with thick glasses that came from an extraordinarily wealthy background. His family had a lot of power and they used it as much as they could to help their son out of the dilemma he was in. He could have had the genes to do miraculous things in this world, but instead he had the genes of a monster. After reading what he did to the girl, it made me physically nauseous and I didn't want anything to do with him. So my boss made me work with him and our ritual was sitting in the seating area every Wednesday night and we would watch One Tree Hill together. We would talk during the show and I got a good insight into his head. It scared me more than any client I have ever worked with. His parents were doctors and he had a lot of access to medication, which he used to poison several of his classmates before his running with the 10 year old. The second guy was what I expected. He was a cross between Ed Kemper for the size and Jared Lee Launer for the look. He was also at age 16, six foot three and around 230 pounds. He had been in for the murder of his four siblings who were left in his care while his mum went to the store. When she returned to find an empty house, she thought that they were out playing and she began to call for them all. Eventually, my client appeared and said that he wanted to show his mum something he did with his brothers and sisters. When she followed him into the woods and saw their bodies, she walked slowly into the house, grabbed her husband's rifle, walked back out 
and shot her son multiple times. He managed to survive, but the statement from the mother was that she looked at her children and for a split second, she seen the future of what was to come for her son. She saw what he really was and all of the families that were going to lose children as a result of him. And that's why she pulled the trigger. His first day with me, he shaved off all of his hair on his body, including his eyebrows and eyelashes. If that wasn't creepy enough, he walked around with this strange look in his eye. One day later that week, I was minding up in the top tier in our unit and he snuck up behind me and he asked me, what would you do if I grabbed you right now, picked you up and threw you off the mezzanine? Apparently, this guy wanted to test me, remembering what they taught me about being cool and calm with the inmates and not getting rattled, I immediately responded to it. His eyes got as wide as dinner plates and he actually went to his room and closed the door. He called over another staff member and told him that I was nuts, but he never told them what I said to him. He also never bothered me again, but he did all of the other people I worked with. I learned a lot from him and learned a lot about how the mind of someone that sick operated. These were the guys that really gave me nightmares. My brother and I had a babysitter named Daryl Keith Rich. I was six years old at the time, my brother not far behind me when Rich started babysitting for us. Three short years later, Rich would go on a summer long murder spree which would shake the foundation of our small community to its core. But I'm getting ahead of myself here, let's start from the beginning. It was actually the neighbour's girl who was hired to sit for us, but he always accompanied her when she watched us, always like co-sitters. Daryl Rich was her boyfriend, but he was clearly the one in charge. He bossed us around and made fun of us, he enjoyed making us cry. He made me watch the Creature Features horror show on TV late at night and laugh when I was crying during the gruesome, frightening and bloody parts. He'd tweak my skull with his fingers and call me a crybaby. Well, duh, I was a baby and he was very cruel. I think either the folks didn't like him, our sleepless, nightmare riddled nights were telling, or the neighbour girl tired of his company broke it off with him, for whatever reason, we didn't have to put up with him for too long. His visits came to an end and we were glad of it. Good riddance, he grew up, so did we. Three years later, I read about three women he raped and killed, and I watched, horror stricken, at the news reports coming in of the little girl he threw off a 10 story bridge. She lived a little while in agony at the bottom of that lonely ravine. She was around my age at the time of her death, disturbing. It was front page news in our small town. It made me dry heave to see his photo splashed up on the screen in living color like that. It was a strange coincidence that one of his victims happened to be my father's high school sweetheart his first bride, whom he wed fresh out of high school. That marriage didn't last though, they divorced shortly after. I only met her a few brief times, I didn't know her well, but I felt sorry for her, oh so sorry. When Rich was finally caught and convicted for his heinous crimes, he was given the death penalty, which carried out at the San Quentin prison March 15th, 2000. I'm not certain if those were his only victims though, those were the only ones he confessed to, there may have been many others. There were a lot of unsolved homicides in that era in the North State. Last year, I found some old recordings of us kids goofing around with the recorder, telling stories. In one recording, my brother is very young, maybe six. He tells a story of peering into a window at this old guy and suddenly feeling the rage build up inside of him. He tells of breaking into the man's house and taking his life. Then, in his own words, the chilling words of a child can be heard saying, I kinda like this hat, so I kept it as a souvenir. I don't know if Daryl Keith Rich was confessing a crime to my brother when he told him that story, or if it was a fantasy. I do know that when I heard the recording, I had a cold chill run through my whole body and I knew immediately that I was hearing a voice beyond the grave spoken through my brother. My little brother even had the accent and the idiosyncratic pauses of Rich. He was imitating him. It made my skin crawl, especially the part about the hat. For children do not know the serial killer's pension to keep souvenirs of their victims. If you don't know what the famous word fantods means, 
now would be the time to look it up. This video I will never forget. I met a convicted murderer and racist who faked his own death, fled the country, slipped across the northern border, lived under an assumed name and raped and beat at least three more women before he was caught. In the fall of 1977, I was attending St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I was a member of a fraternity and lived in the fraternity house. Thanks to the generosity of our alumni, we had a large 15 bedroom house, but many of our members were already local and continued to live at home whilst at school. So we would rent out the extra rooms to men who were attending university. They were not required to join the fraternity, but they were invited to do so if we felt that they would be good brothers. That fall, we had a tenant named Ian Green, who said that he came from Yukon territory near the Alaskan border. When he would get things wrong, like saying governor or president instead of premier or prime minister, or miles instead of kilometers, he would say that it was because he was homeschooled by American parents. He also claimed to be 19 while he looked in his mid 20s at least. For these and other similar reasons, we didn't trust him and he wasn't invited to join the fraternity. He was well liked, charming and incredibly intelligent, but there was just something about him that seemed off somehow. It's not so much that we didn't socialize, he was very entertaining. He would frequently come up to the room and use the internet. This being back in the days of dial up ISPs and not everyone had home internet. One night in the summer of 1998, a bunch of us went down to the town for drinks. Me and a few girlfriends and just some friends who were girls and also Ian. I overindulged a bit and called a cab to go home around 1am. But a few people, including Ian, stayed out till 3.30 when the bars closed. He had met a young woman and brought her home with him, sharing a cab with a guy called Mike and his girlfriend. Mike's room was immediately above Ian's and about an hour after arriving home, Mike heard what sounded like yelling coming from below him. As this was summer and classes were out, many of the bedrooms were empty. Plus the house was pretty well soundproofed since it was built for a bunch of young men. But still, Mike heard and went to check what was happening. I learned this all from Mike because I was heavily asleep at the opposite side of the house. Upon approaching Ian's bedroom door, Mike could hear the young woman Ian brought home screaming for help. Mike banged on the door only to have Ian yell out that everything was fine and that she had fallen and hurt herself and he was taking care of it. Mike, not believing him, woke up Troy, the house manager who had a master key. They went and opened Ian's door and saw that the woman's clothes were ripped off and she was bleeding. In their shock, Ian ran past them and out the back door. The police were called, but he was long gone before they arrived. When I awoke the next morning, police officers were coming in and out of his room and still interviewing Mike, Troy, and Chris, our chapter president, who had spent the night at his girlfriend's. The local news had his photo and description. Three days passed before he was spotted and arrested. This is where it gets really interesting. His ID was fake and his fingerprints didn't match any in the police's databases. He refused to answer any questions and for nearly a week, he was held without anyone knowing who he was. This made the national news. A couple in upstate New York was watching the Canadian news and saw the story and recognized him as William Shrubsall. William Shrubsall was apparently a gifted student with an overbearing and verbally abusive mother. When he came home late from a high school graduation party, she was heard yelling at him for having a girlfriend. Neighbors had heard this before. However, that night, he responded by taking a baseball bat and killing his mother. Because of his age and the circumstances, he was served 16 months as a minor. This was in 1988. In 1996, he was charged with sexually assaulting a 17 year old woman in 1977, while out on bail, during his trial, he left a suicide note saying that he was going to jump off Niagara Falls. A few months later, he moved into my home as Ian. While searching his room, the police found ID belonging to two other assault victims, one sexually assaulted and one beaten with a baseball bat. They were both from the Halifax area whose assailants had never been caught. Both women identified Shrubsall once he was in custody. While there can't be any kind of happy ending to this kind of story, the criminal justice system in Canada 
not only found him guilty on all counts, giving him a life sentence, he was also declared as a dangerous offender. A life sentence can still include parole, but dangerous offender status means that he can be kept in prison for as long as he is believed to still be a threat or to re-offend. The designation requires regular psychiatric reviews and he has been found to be unrepentant and likely to re-offend every time. Plus, if he somehow ever gets out of prison in Canada, he would be immediately handed over to the American legal system as he was convicted of the assault in New York and will be charged with fleeing the country during his trial. With any luck, this monster will never see the outside of a prison again. The post was updated and this is what it said. In late 2018, Shrubsall was released to American authorities. He will be serving seven years for the assault in New York as well as facing charges for skipping bail during his trial.